are going to ready up for the Jean Monnet lecture. Um, and this year that will be, uh, the speaker is uh, Mike Woodford. Um, and the chair is our board member, uh, Phil Lane. So, uh, Philip, um, over to you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Let me just check this. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, this year's uh, keynote lecture. Uh, and I, let me say a word about th this Jean Monnet lecture, because having this named lecture, I think, is a special status at the ECB. Of course, Jean Monnet uh, was one of the founding fathers of the European Union. And uh, we can think of that as the fact that he was very early in having a vision about what was needed in, in post-war Europe. So I think uh, here at ECB, we think of Jean Monnet as a, as a visionary and as, an, as a pioneer in, in the formation of the European Union. Now, the, the parallel I'm going to make is with Mike, Mike Woodford. Of course, a lot of his work throughout his career has been really, if you like, uh, ahead of uh, the, the rest of the profession. So, so that, that having that visionary status, um, I, th I think is a fair description. Uh, by the way, uh, just because we just had a conversation there about the fiscal theory to price level, I have a vivid memory from the early 1990s going to an NBR uh, seminar where I think Mike was talking about the fiscal theory and to the kind of uh, extreme misunderstanding in the room. People just didn't. And by now, 25 years later, it's much more uh, uh, better understood if, if still remaining a work in progress. So, uh, here at the ECB, uh, we, we greatly value all of the work that uh, uh, Mike Woodford has done on monetary policy, on central banking, and of course, I'm pretty sure in, in every office, there's a copy of interest and uh, prices. But let, let me also mention, uh, before I get to today's topic, that the work he's doing now uh, on uh, cognition and decisions, his lab at, at Columbia, and more generally, the, the, it, trying to combine the work of, from co cognitive psychology and neuroscience into macro, I think really, I think has a lot of potential. I mean, anyone who spends any time trying to make economic policy, monetary policy knows immediately, uh, both to understand the economy, but also understand their policy making. Uh, I think uh, that line of research has a, has a lot to offer. Now, today, uh, ironically, maybe for uh, a central bank conference, uh, the, the, the focus is on the limits of monetary policy. Now, I think uh, we also share that view in the context, especially of a pandemic, because in a pandemic, it's clear uh, the central bank, including the ECB, has to be very busy. We have to stabilize markets. We have to make sure we're providing uh, the monetary accommodation we can provide. But it's also super clear, given the multi-sector asymmetric nature of a pandemic, that there's a lot the central bank cannot do. Uh, and this, we, we see this, we see governments having very extensive uh, uh, run-ups in debt, and with a lot of that intervention taking the form of transfers to those who've lost their uh, job, to businesses that have had to be shut down for public health reasons. And I think it, it, it's, it's so important that we also have uh, academic work trying to look at, well, you know, what should be happening? What exactly is the role of fiscal policy and what type of fiscal policy in addition uh, uh, to, to whatever central banks can do? So, so given, given that topic, uh, you know, uh, we, I think we're going to learn a lot in the next 45 minutes. So, uh, you know, as a standard, uh, the, the mic will speak for, for the next three quarters of an hour. And then uh, those who, who have questions, please use the uh, chat function to send them to me. And then we will have a Q&A session for the balance of the hour. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn over to, to, to Mike. So please. Thanks. It's, um, it's a pleasure to be invited um, to speak to all of you and to give uh, this lecture in honor of one of Europe's greatest statesmen, uh, Jean Monnet. The topic that I want to talk about today is um, an issue raised by recent events. Uh, as Phil mentioned, uh, the, the challenge for macroeconomic stabilization policy prevented, prevented by the COVID-19 pandemic. 
But I want to talk not just about that specific situation, but also about a more general issue for the theory of stabilization policy, which is the respective roles of monetary and fiscal policy in macroeconomic stabilization. So as, um, as many of you are well aware uh, here at the ECB and elsewhere, uh, the events of the last decade, which have been very dramatic for central banks, have led um, in recent years uh, to a number of central banks reconsidering their basic monetary policy strategy. I understand the ECB is currently in the middle of such a review. The Fed has uh, just announced conclusions from its review. Other central banks uh, are, are, are similarly reconsidering their basic strategies. The orthodoxy that had developed before the great financial crisis in the so-called great moderation period um, generally argued that stabilization policy could be considered essentially as a one-dimensional problem. Why was that? Well, it was argued that these separate issues, the issue of whether aggregate real activity was in line with the economy's uh, productive potential, the extent to which aggregate nominal spending growth was consistent with price stability, and the more technical question, but very important for what central banks do, of whether real interest rates were thought to be in line with the Wixellian natural rate, the intertemporal relative price that would be associated with achieving an efficient allocation of resources. It was argued that to an important extent, these three questions were tightly linked to each other. Um, it was not a bad approximation to regard them as essentially equivalent, which meant then that there was only one thing that you were interested in trying to ensure. And so if you could use interest rate policy, a single instrument, to ensure that that third bullet point was true, move interest rates to try to track variations in where interest rates needed to be to be in line with the natural rate of interest. That instrument that would allow you to do that one thing should be enough to ensure that the other two conditions were simultaneously being satisfied as well. And then those would correspond to the main two objectives of stabilization policy at, um, at most central banks. But events since the global financial crisis have cast important doubts, at least on the adequacy of the methods that were previously being used to pursue what was often thought of as a one-dimensional objective. In particular, many central banks reached an effective lower bound for their policy rates, uh, often by late 2008, at least by early in 2009, a very large number of central banks found themselves um, in that position, while being in a situation where economic activity it was apparent that it was far below potential. Uh, in many cases, these central banks were also undershooting their inflation targets. So the argument for additional demand stimulus seemed clear, but the traditional tool of interest rate cuts was no longer available. So these um, current reviews of monetary policy strategy have been giving a lot of focus to that issue. Uh, asking, uh, for example, what additional tools can be deployed in a situation where conventional monetary policy is constrained by this effective lower bound. I think, though, that discussions of the question have typically, they've discussed various uh, novel types of uh, instruments that might help to deal with that problem. They typically take for granted still that a recessionary shock calls for a reduction in real interest rates and that what the new discussions are about are simply finding further means to reduce real interest rates um, if one reaches this effective lower bound. So one um, idea uh, that's gotten a lot of discussion is, well, can you in fact find ways to push policy rates below what had previously been thought of as the effective lower bound? So experimenting with negative interest rates, uh, discussions of institutional changes like abolishing cash, to make more sharply negative interest rates feasible in the future. There have been calls from some uh, parties to increase the inflation target, the idea being that with um, inflation expectations constantly higher, there would be more room to reduce real interest rates subject to the effect of lower bound on nominal rates. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion of various kinds of market interventions that central banks can undertake to try to reduce spreads between longer term interest rates and the policy rate so that some real interest rates can be made lower 
despite the fact that there's a lower bound on the policy rate. But another possible response, I think, um, that I'd urge people to think more about is that perhaps finding ways to lower uh, real interest rates on safe assets further is not um, always the central problem and that we may need to move away from sole reliance on interest rate cuts to stabilize the economy when, um, when output uh, is, is too low. In particular, I think it's important to think about making more use of state contingent fiscal transfers as a tool of stabilization policy. And the argument that I want to suggest for this is not just the argument that people will be pretty familiar with, which is that countercyclical fiscal transfers might be necessary if you reach a situation where the effect of lower bound prevents you um, from using additional monetary stimulus. Often those discussions assume that what you would ideally do is cut interest rates further. They often assume that fiscal policy is essentially another way of having the same effect on your stabilization objectives as interest rates cuts do, a view that was sometimes called Tobin's funnel for the view of what monetary and fiscal policy could do, saying that essentially um, their effects are funneled through the same channel, namely their effects on aggregate demand. Uh, from that point of view, the only reason for thinking about fiscal policy for stabilization purposes would be if interest rate policy for some reason uh, can't be used, perhaps because of the effect of lower bound. Instead, what I want to argue today is that sometimes interest rate policy is going to be inadequate to achieve stabilization objectives, not because real interest rates haven't been reduced enough, and that if one could find a way to cut real interest rates further, um, the problem would be largely eliminated, but rather because interest rate policy is sometimes the wrong tool to address the fundamental economic problem. I think the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which has clearly been an economic disruption of unprecedented magnitude, um, is an occasion that particularly makes us think about this issue of whether interest rate cuts um, are really um, the response. I'm sorry, I have the wrong slides. I'm very unhappy. Um, but um, I'm not sure what I can do at this point, uh, but try to uh, uh, try to use it. But anyway, one obvious issue raised by the pandemic um, is that it's obviously a situation where some economic activities have had to be suspended uh, for public health reasons. And so this means that the fact that there's been a sharp reduction in GDP is not necessarily in itself a sign that stabilization policy is needed. Um, under an efficient allocation of resources, I think one can argue that overall GDP would be lower because of the need for public health reasons to, uh, to suspend some otherwise productive uh, and useful economic activities. But the question arises, how can one decide whether um, all of the reduction in economic activity that we've seen, which has been quite dramatic, is in fact um, efficient? And I, I think an important uh, thing to think about, and I think it's reasonable to think in this situation, is that the amount by which output and employment have declined could be much greater than what would have been efficient, um, even given uh, the public health constraints. And the reason I want to stress in the model that I'm going to present here is that this is a type of shock that d has disrupted the circular flow of payments. Uh, resulting in a collapse of what Keynes in his general theory called effective demand, meaning the demand that can be expressed in the marketplace um, because people are able to pay for the things that they would like and uh, uh, able to pay for the things that ideally would be allocated to them. Uh, the particular type of shock that we've just experienced is a particularly good example of something where an important part of its effects come through this disruption of the circular flow of payments. So it might be assumed that if I say the level of output following the shock is inefficiently low, that means then that interest rate cuts are obviously called for. What I'm going to show is, um, at least in a simple model, that the real interest rate required to support an efficient equilibrium in the case of a shock like that may not have changed at all. 
And the model that I'm going to propose is one in which monetary policy can increase real activity through interest rate cuts. So it's not going to be the case that I'm going to say interest rate cuts are not the appropriate tool because I'm going to make assumptions that imply they can't further stimulate economic activity. But it's nonetheless going to be a model in which the stimulus to further economic activity from interest rate cuts um, is not going to be of a kind that even with very dramatic interest rate cuts would fully restore efficiency. Um, depending on assumptions, it's not even necessarily obvious that real interest rate cuts, cuts in the rate of return on safe assets is going to be welfare improving at all. And instead, I'm going to argue that fiscal transfers respond much more directly to this underlying problem, which as I said, is the disruption of, uh, of the circular flow of payments where transfers from the government can essentially uh, make up for payments flows that are not spontaneously occurring um, in the private economy. Um, so again, I'm, I'm very unhappy that, um, that I don't have the right slides um, um, and I'm not sure what, why I've uploaded the wrong set. But anyway, let me, let me talk about the model that will uh, try to clarify these ideas. So I'm going to present a simple uh, end sector model of the economy. The need for the multiple sectors is to explain what I mean by the circular flow of payments and the possibility of asymmetric shocks that have very sharply differential effects on different parts of the economy disrupting uh, this circular flow. This is an issue that doesn't arise um, in a one sector model and uh, many traditional discussions of uh, the role of interest rate policy assume a setup where when you have shocks to supply and demand, uh, they can change the efficient level of economic activity, they can change the Wixellian natural rate of interest, so they can change the level of real interest rates required to support an efficient level of activity, but because of the one sector structure, um, as economic activity goes up and down, and as one changes the level of real interest rates, one always has a balanced circular flow with the, uh, the income to each unit in the economy balancing its outflows at each point in time. And so this issue of shocks disrupting the circular flow doesn't arise. It's because of that that the need for fiscal transfers as opposed to simply regulating the level of interest rates doesn't arise. Um, I want to be able to talk about asymmetric shocks. I need this end sector model. It is going to be about as simple as possible a model, though, subject to getting a non-trivial circular flow of payments into it. Um, it's going to be an example of what's sometimes called a yeoman farmer model. In each of these end sectors, I'll have a continuum of units that are simultaneously producers and consumers. Um, the, same, um, the same number of these producer consumer units in each of the sectors of the economy. Each of these units is specialized in producing a single product, which is the product of that sector, but I'm going to assume that their consumption is not equally specialized. They will consume the products of other sectors as well, and that's where the circular flow of payments is going to matter. Um, for simplicity, uh, many calculations are simplified by a simple structure where I'm going to order these n sectors on a circle, um, and I'm going to use modulo n arithmetic for adding and subtracting numbers to the index of a sector. Uh, so sector n plus 1 uh, will be the same as sector 1. Uh, for any sector j, j plus 1 will be the sector located counterclockwise around the circle relative to that, uh, that sector. The preferences of one of these units uh, in any of the sectors is they want to maximize a discounted sum of utility flows uh, with some discount factor beta. In each period, the utility flow will come from utility from consumption from a set of goods in their own sector and in other sectors, and a disutility of supplying this YJ as the output supply uh, of the sector unit, uh, sector J units, uh, their own sectors. Um, outputs. Uh, crucially, in this utility function, specifying the utility from consumption of the output of the different sectors, there are those coefficients alpha sub k. It's a set of non-negative coefficients. Uh, I'm going to assume that they sum to one, and um, uh, that's going to indicate the degree of interest of consumers in a given sector in consuming the output 
of other sectors, those are going to allow for non-trivial network structures, and this network structure of payments is going to be crucial to, um, uh, to many conclusions. Um, so an important thing about this setup is the additive separability that makes a lot of calculation simple and it's particularly going to mean that shutting down some sector J is not going to be assumed to affect the utility from consuming or producing the goods that are consumed that are produced by the other sectors. So I'm going to be abstracting completely from issues of preference complementarity or technological complementarity, uh, not because I think don't think those exist, but it's going to let us focus clearly on this issue of the circular flow of payments. I'm going to assume those weights alpha sub k are the same for all the sectors, meaning that I have a rotational symmetry um, in the network structure. The meaning of the coefficients alpha sub k is that in a situation where all the goods have the same price, it'll be optimal for units in any given sector J to allocate their expenditure such that fraction alpha K of their total spending is allocated to spending on the goods of the sector that are K steps away from them around the circle. And that'll be true for all of the different sectors. I'm going to assume that at least the coefficients for purchases from your own sector and the one one step away from you are non-zero. So here's two examples of the kind of network structures with this circular symmetry that the notation allows for. And I'll talk some about results for these polar cases. The uniform network structure on the left is one where I assume the alpha sub k's are all equal to one fifth, which is one over the number of sectors, um, so that everyone spends exactly the same amount when prices are equal on the products of all the other sectors. And units in every sector purchase, want to purchase the same consumption basket as units in every other sector. An example of a non-uniform network structure, kind of an extreme case, is this chain network structure shown on the right. Here, every units in every sector purchase from their own sector and purchase from the sector, which is one step around them counterclockwise on the circle and don't purchase from the other sectors we'll see that what kind of network structure we have is going to, um, is going to be important um, for conclusions about the effects of the pandemic shock and the effects of fiscal transfers, the effects of monetary policy as well. And um, so I'm going to focus, I'm going to not talk about these aggregate shocks, I'm sorry that's on the slide. Um, I'm going to talk about though a pandemic shock where I'm going to assume that at the initial period t equals zero, people learn that there's going to be no production or consumption of the good produced by one sector, some sector J, um, in period zero. I'm going to assume that if that happens, it lasts for only one period. Uh, for simplicity, uh, it's not going to be expected ever to recur, so all the uncertainty is going to be resolved in period zero. And for some of the discussion, it's going to be relevant that I'm going to assume that there's an equal ex ante probability of each of these sectors being the affected one. So that ex ante, I still have this rotational symmetry of the setup. So under that assumption, before the state at time zero is learned, before it's learned whether the pandemic shock is occurring, and if so, which sector is impacted, the model has complete rotational symmetry. One convenience of that is that um, it makes the welfare objective that makes sense in the model completely clear because ex ante, everyone in the economy agrees on what their ex ante ranking of different policies from t equals zero on would be. Everyone would like best the policy that achieves the highest possible value of the average of discounted utilities averaging across the end sectors with equal weights. Um, and so that's an ex post objective, an objective for, for valuing outcomes from t equals zero onward after uncertainty has been resolved, but the policy that achieves the highest value of that is the one that everyone would like ex ante before they know uh, which, which sector is going to be impacted by the shock if it occurs. Um, so I'm going to be interested in what can happen in equilibrium uh, using a particular set of stabilization policies that are possible in a decentralized market economy. So I have to say something now, not just about preferences and technologies, but about um, what kind of institutions I assume in this decentralized economy and what the policy instruments are. I'm going to just focus on perfect foresight equilibrium from T equals zero onwards, since there's no further uncertainty to resolve. 
In the model, I'm going to assume there are spot markets for each of the goods, these end goods produced by the different sectors uh, with a money price uh, for the good produced by each of the sectors. There's also going to be trading in a one period nominal asset, therefore a nominal interest rate, IT, the interest rate between periods T and T plus one. Each of these units will have a flow budget constraint in period T uh, based on those prices. Um, so it's total spending on the output of all the sectors on the left, the nominal income from the sale of your own sectors output on the right. The AJ on the right is the beginning asset balances of units in sector J, but that's going to be after any taxes and transfers. So there might be fiscal transfers that modify that AJ uh, at the beginning of period T. Um, the BJ is the end of period asset balances. And you see at the right of the top of the slide, I'm assuming a borrowing constraint. I'll assume that in fact, uh, as in uh, Marco Bassetto's model, uh, that there's anonymity of the borrowers. And so um, uh, ended period asset balances will have to be non-negative. Asset balances then evolve according to this equation at the bottom of the slide where IT is the nominal interest rate on this one. Uh, one type of risk lit asset and tau is a lump sum tax collection. If it's negative, it's a lump sum uh, transfer. And I'm going to assume that at least after this first period when the shock occurs, lump sum tax collections will be the same for all sectors, but I can, uh, there will be some results about sector specific transfers in period zero. The policy tools to consider, monetary policy, uh, the central bank will be able to set the interest rate on this single riskless asset uh, that may be constrained by uh, a lower bound here i've written the uh, lower bound as a zero lower bound um, but that'll be the instrument of conventional monetary policy we'll also consider the effect of lump sum fiscal transfers um, in response to the shock uh, in period t equals zero after that, we'll assume that uh, lump sum taxes are levied in a way that's uh, uniform across the different sectors and that the path of um, those future tax collections uh, do achieve a target path uh, for the real public debt that satisfies uh, the transversality condition. So again, we're not asking what would happen if the fiscal authority tries to do something uh, contrary to that. Um, so. Uh, Turning now to what happens in equilibrium in the case of the pandemic shock, a first thing to ask is, well, uh, what is the first best allocation and, and can it be supported as an equilibrium? Uh, I told you what the first best allocation is. It would be to continue to produce the same amount of all the goods except the sector that has been shut down by the pandemic, produce the same quantities, allocate them to the same people um, as if no pandemic shock has occurred. Uh, can that be supported as an equilibrium under the institutions I've assumed? If one had an ex ante market for insurance against the pandemic shock, the answer is uh, yes. I'm not going to go through the, uh, uh, the mathematics of that, although in the paper I go through the equilibrium with ex ante insurance. And the answer is you can achieve the first best allocation um, when that insurance exists without monetary or fiscal policy having to do anything different than they would in the case that no pandemic shock occurred. So no fiscal transfers are needed. Uh, the monetary policy rule can be the one that tracks uh, the natural rate of interest. And in fact, interest rates don't have to change in that equilibrium. Um, I'm gonna skip that though. Uh, the case of more practical interest is, well, what if those insurance contracts don't exist? And in practice with the current pandemic, that's largely been the case that there have not been uh, uh, enforceable insurance contracts that worked for very many, uh, very many firms. Suppose there are no such contracts and suppose also there's no policy response. So the policy is the one that would have been fine if you had had the ex ante insurance, but we ask what happens without it. The result can be an equilibrium with a much greater reduction of economic activity than in the efficient allocation. And this is going to come about because of this problem of a collapse of effective demand owing to the disruption of the circular flow of payments. Note that the natural rate of interest has actually not changed. The level of real interest rates that would support the first best allocation as a decentralized equilibrium has actually not changed, but there is uh, a collapse um, of effective demand. People are no longer uh, receiving income 
uh, at least in the sector that's been impacted by the shock, but then the sectors that people in that sector used to spend on are going to be receiving less income because of that reduced spending. Uh, the people that they used to spend on products of receive less income because of the reduction in their spending and so on. And so one gets to an equilibrium in which uh, there's much less demand uh, for many products than would occur in this um, ex ante optimal allocation, the first best allocation of resources under the welfare criterion that I've described. So I'm first going to consider, well, what would happen in the limiting case where the level, total level of liquid assets in the economy is quite low. And this is assuming a situation that would actually not have been inefficient if we had only aggregate shocks. So we could have shocks to supply and demand that affect all the sectors equally um, and that change the Wixellian natural rate of interest. If they affect all the sectors equally, so that the circular flow of payments remains balanced at all times, no matter what you're doing with monetary policy and no matter how shocks uh, have been affecting supply and demand, uh, one has a situation where it's possible for the economy to achieve the first best allocation of resources in equilibrium with a very low level of liquid assets. And that's because in equilibrium, inflows are always sufficient to finance outflows. Uh, okay, so suppose we're in that situation, but we have this pandemic shock instead. Given the pandemic shock, uh, I'm going to assume uh, sector one without loss of generality is the one that has to be shut down. We have predetermined prices. Uh, prices, I think I forgot to mention that, are, are being fixed um, one period in advance um, in this model. So when the pandemic shock occurs, prices have already been fixed. So we have equal prices for all of the goods that are still able to be sold. Given those equal prices, uh, units in every sector will still allocate their consumption across the sectors that haven't been shut down in response to these coefficients alpha. So we can write uh, consumption demand for units in sector J for the product of sector K as a multiple of total spending by units in sector J using this matrix now capital A of coefficients uh, that have been modified because one of the sectors have been shut down, but it's completely determined by those original alpha coefficients that determine the network structure and by the identity of the sector. Uh, that's been shut down. So that matrix A is going to be uh, important for computing the equilibrium. Okay, so suppose the sectors are operating with a low level of initial liquid balances. Fiscal policy doesn't do anything about that. Uh, then in equilibrium, we have to have zero, essentially zero asset balances at the end of period for all the sectors, because the only way to satisfy the borrowing constraint in each sector uh, given that there's going to be overall close to zero liquid assets is to have uh, close to zero liquid assets at the end of the period uh, for each of the sectors. So now what's going to have to happen in equilibrium is total spending by each sector K is going to have to be the value of the output produced in equilibrium in period zero by sector K. That will be given by the A matrix multiplying the vector of spending, total spending by each of the sectors and so this vector of total spending levels, uh, bold face C, in period zero uh, has to satisfy an eigenvector condition. So this uh, matrix A, the vector of spending levels is a right eigenvector of that matrix. It has to have an eigenvalue equal to one. We know what the matrix is, so we can ask uh, what that eigenvector has to be. In fact, under my assumptions, uh, there has to be a unique right eigenvector with this eigenvalue of one. Um, it corresponds to the vector of stationary probabilities if A is the transition probability matrix for a Markov chain. Um, so if you're familiar with the mathematics of computing stationary probabilities for finite state Markov chains, you know where this eigenvector comes from. Uh, that's how the matrix A is going to be determining that eigenvector pi. The vector of spending levels has to be some multiple of that eigenvector pi multiplied by some factor theta, which is non-negative. What is the theta? Well, now we have an Euler condition, which says the margin utility of additional spending in period zero has to be greater than or equal to the marginal utility um, in the next period, which under my assumptions is going to be U prime evaluated at Y bar. Y bar is the 
efficient level of spending, the common level of spending you have in each of the sectors in the uh, first best equilibrium from period one onward. We know what that quantity is. That puts an upper bound on what the spending CJ, total spending by units in sector J, can be in period zero for each of the sectors. That gives us an inequality constraint. That inequality has to be an equality for at least one sector if we assume there's some positive amount of liquid assets um, in the economy, even if it's small. So there has to be at least one sector for which the Euler condition holds with equality. That lets us solve for this factor of theta. Theta has to be the minimum over the sectors of this quantity that uh, this factor that would be required to raise spending in some sector enough to make the Euler condition hold with equality. We get a unique solution for theta. Um, there's going to have to be at least one sector with the optimal level of spending and for which borrowing constraints aren't going to bind in period zero, but there'll necessarily be at least one sector with insufficient spending. Uh, so there is going to be an effective demand shortfall. How severe that is, is going to depend on the network structure of payments. The network structure of payments determines this matrix A that determines what that right eigenvector pi is like. The vector of spending in equilibrium is proportional to that eigenvector pi. Uh, so the network structure is crucially going to determine how much spending collapses. So here are these two numerical examples I showed on an earlier slide. Um, the uniform network structure on the left, the chain network structure on the right. In each case, the black dosh, dashed lines indicate the normal level of spending in each of the sectors. That's the um, efficient level of spending if there were no pandemic shock and also the equilibrium with standard um, monetary policy, the real interest rate in line with the natural rate of interest if there were no pandemic shock. The efficient response, the first best allocation of resources with the pandemic shock is shown by the red outlines. And you see that in the uniform case, um, the spending of each of the five sectors should be reduced in equilibrium by the same amount. Uh, that's because of the uniform network structure. Everyone should reduce their spending by the amount that they used to spend on the products of sector one, but spending should be uniformly reduced throughout the economy. The optimal uh, level of spending in the first best allocation in the case of the chain structure is more complicated. It's shown by the red outlines over there, but basically people who didn't buy from sector one before should continue to spend as much as they did before. Sectors that did purchase from sector one reduced their total spending by the amount that they used to spend on the products of sector one, but they spend the same amount on other product sectors. What happens in equilibrium is not the red outlines, but the blue bars. This equilibrium is determined by that eigenvector, scaling up the eigenvector as much as is necessary to get at least one sector not to be borrowing constrained, which means it is spending its efficient amount. In the case of the uniform structure, that means sectors two, three, four, and five all spend the efficient amount and are not borrowing constrained, but sector one that had to be shut down has no income, cannot spend at all. So we do get a collapse of spending relative to the efficient level, even in the case of the uniform structure. In the case of the chain network, though, this is much more dramatic. Um, in equilibrium, spending completely collapses in sectors one, two, three, and four. Uh, spending is at the efficient level in sector five, although that's a big reduction uh, from, its normal, uh, from its normal level of spending. And so we see that depending on the network structure, this disruption of the circular flow of payments may result uh, in a very severe reduction of economic activity relative to what would be efficient, even taking into account that it's efficient to shut down some activities. Okay, so what if one takes the uh, conventional way of thinking about a situation where aggregate demand is lower than the efficient level of economic activity and say, well, then that means you need to cut interest rates in response to the shock. Uh, my model is one where cutting the interest rate will affect real economic activity because I'm assuming that prices are predetermined for a period. What happens about the analysis above, though, of equilibrium in period zero? The only change is that the Euler condition now involves that nominal interest rate to the extent to which the nominal interest rate is higher or lower than the one associated with the previous policy. 
uh, which is here denoted I bar. Uh, so that changes uh, where the level of spending that would correspond to not be borrowing constrained is for each of the sectors. But the argument about the vector of spending having to be a multiple of that right eigenvector continues to be the case. And so it only changes the factor theta by which we have to scale up that eigenvector to get um, at least one sector not to be borrowing constrained, but for the Euler condition to still hold as an equality for all of the sectors. So it changes the value of theta. That's all it changes. Can you, you can increase spending then by making theta bigger, by cutting interest rates, but um, can you get to the efficient allocation of resources? The answer is no, because in this example, the efficient allocation of resources is shown by the red uh, regions. What cutting interest rates can do is it can lift the location of the constraint, borrowing constraint. It can make the red we can make the line corresponding to not being borrowing constraint and move up. So the blue bars have to be scaled up. The factor theta has to increase until at least one sector is not borrowing constraint. So the blue bars all get multiplied by a common factor, but that isn't going to give you the efficient allocation of resources. In the left panel, it doesn't do it because it doesn't do anything to uh, allow sector one to be able to spend. In the right case, the situation is much more dramatic only sector five will increase its spending when you cut interest rates. It can't do anything to increase spending by people in sectors one, two, three, or four. So it's very far from um, achieve, being able to achieve the efficient allocation of resources. Um, okay, uh, one can actually show that in the case of the chain network, if the disutility of supplying output is a linear uh, a disutility function, then the increased activity, not only does it not get you to the first best, but it actually lowers uh, welfare. That's an extreme case, um, but it shows that the mere fact that aggregate demand is insufficient and that interest rate cuts increase aggregate demand uh, is a very different thing from showing that they, that they increase welfare. What about fiscal transfers? Can lump sum taxes and transfers help in response to this kind of shock? I didn't talk about the responses to, uh, to shocks that affect all the sectors equally. In that case, one can show that a transfer policy achieves nothing uh, because of the balanced circular flow of payments. Borrowing constraints don't bind for anyone. Uh, changing the timing of lump sum taxes and transfers doesn't change anyone's intertemporal budget constraints. Here, instead, that's different. With the pandemic shock, borrowing constraints have to be binding for at least some of the sectors, perhaps for many sectors. One can show then that lump sum transfers will change the equilibrium allocation, and they can actually do more than interest rate cuts can do. So for example, you can achieve um, the first best allocation of resources through lump sum uh, uh, taxes and transfers. One simple way to do it is if you can sectorally target taxes and transfers, you can replicate what that ideal ex ante insurance contract would do. You transfer this amount uh, indicated on the slide to the units in sector one, and you pay for it by levying a tax on each of the other sectors. The transfers you make to sector one replace the revenue they've lost during due, due to the shutdown, the revenues from spending by other sectors, so not 100% of their previous revenues, the revenues they were getting from spending by units in other sectors, and you tax the units in the other sectors by the amount that they used to spend on the goods from sector one. In principle, you could do that without any increase in the level of the public debt if you could have sectorally targeted taxes and transfers. A more realistic case might be to suppose we can't have sectorally targeted uh, taxes, and perhaps we can't have sectorally targeted transfers either. What if you can only uh, just send checks uniformly to everyone in the economy and then pay for it in the future by raising lump sum taxes also uniformly across all the sectors in the economy? The answer uh, in that case, I'm uh, running out of time, but we could analyze equilibrium now with transfers changing the level of initial asset positions. Um, now this vector of expenditure in period zero by each of the different sectors satisfies a set of equations which um, say that 
spending, total spending by sector K is the minimum of two quantities. One is the C star K, that was the level of spending um, at which the Euler condition would hold as inequality, the same quantity as it was before, if here I'm assuming no change in interest rates. Um, the other quantity, the amount that the sector will spend if it's borrowing constrained, depends on the matrix A again, depends on the vector of spending by all the other sectors which feed into income of this sector K, but it also depends on this initial level of post-transfer liquid asset balances, AK, uh, for period zero. So that's what fiscal policy can change. We have a fixed point equation now that the level, equilibrium level of spending in the different sectors has to satisfy. Um, this is a multidimensional version of the Keynesian cross. One can show uh, that under the assumptions I've made, there's necessarily a unique fixed point uh, of this. And um, I want to give you some examples of, uh, of what happens. Um, so what I'm going to show you is um, some examples of what you can achieve with those particular network structures that I was talking about before. Uh, two polar cases, the uniform case and the chain case, the general formulas for an arbitrary network structure are in the paper. Uh, but here's a solved, these two solved examples again. And what I'm looking at is the case where the kind of transfers that are possible are simply uniform transfers. A check of the same size is transferred uh, to all units throughout the economy. It'll be paid for in the future by lump sum taxes, also equally distributed across all the economy. And one is plotting here what happens as the total level of liquid assets post-transfer is increased. That's the quantity A sub zero on the horizontal axis. In the uniform case, um, even without these transfers, sectors two, three, four, and five were not borrowing constrained. You'll remember, um, giving them transfers doesn't change their level of spending. They still spend the amount that the Euler condition uh, says they want to spend when they're not borrowing constrained with no change in interest rate policy. That doesn't change. Transfers do increase spending of sector one. That's the red region up at the top. The bigger the transfer, the more spending increases in sector one, up till this point labeled A hat sub four, where sector one ceases to be borrowing constrained as well. After that, further transfers do nothing. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, that does necessarily raise welfare. And it once you get to this point A hat sub four, you've achieved the first best allocation of resources. So beyond that point, further transfers aren't needed because no one is borrowing constrained, but also you have achieved the first best allocation of resources. Things are more complicated in the figure on the right with the chain network structure. Now, initially sector five is not borrowing constrained. The transfers don't affect its spending, but initially at low levels of liquid assets, spending is increased for all the other four sectors. As you further increase the size of the transfers, sectors progressively cease to be borrowing constrained. After each sector ceases to be borrowing constrained, there are no further increases in spending in that sector. So what you see is that the fiscal transfer multiplier can be quite high. Um, in this chain example with a low initial level of liquid assets, the initial multiplier is high. Uh, as the level of liquid assets gets higher, the multipliers go down and they eventually fall to zero once transfers are big enough for no one to be borrowing constrained. Again, a sufficiently large transfer of this untargeted type will eventually achieve the first best allocation of resources. And I show that it's not just for these two network structures, uh, that's true uh, quite generally in the model. Um, so one can show that um, um, even if you can't have uh, targeted transfers, um, fiscal policy, and even of a relatively uh, poorly targeted um, uh, lump sum transfers can be very beneficial. Uh, to summarize what that implies, I mean, we find that conventional monetary policy is poorly suited to respond to this kind of shock. Um, it can increase aggregate demand. It's not because I'm assuming there is no way to increase aggregate spending, but it doesn't get the composition right. In particular, it necessarily doesn't get income uh, to sector one. Um, fiscal transfers are instead effective in this circumstance. Uh, if large enough, even when uh, very poorly targeted, they can eliminate the distortions resulting from the disruption to the flow of payments. 
And so one observes that uh, fiscal transfers have an advantage at increasing aggregate demand in this kind of situation. Why is that? I mean, one reason is that in the model, monetary policy uh, isn't getting income to sector one, the one that had to be shut down, while it's still efficient for units in that sector that have shut down, it's still efficient for them to be buying food, be buying shelter, uh, to be you know, paying for education if they have to pay for that privately and so on. Uh, those things cannot be achieved uh, certainly by, um, by interest rate cuts in the model. Fiscal transfers, even if only part of the transfers go to sector one, they are helping to relax budget constraints in sector one. But another reason why fiscal transfers are more effective is that interest rate cuts, when they increase demand, necessarily do this in a distorted way. The Wixellian natural rate of interest has not fallen. Cutting inter real interest rates relative to that is necessarily producing an inefficient pattern of spending, um, which offsets um, any benefits that are coming from um, from the interest rate cuts. In the case of the fiscal transfers, even when they're poorly targeted, you send a lot of the transfers to sectors maybe that are no longer borrowing constrained. In that case, in the model, people don't have a reason to do inefficient spending. They should rationally save then the additional money. And we saw, in fact, a lot of in the US, at least a lot of the transfers made in response to COVID um, were saved or used to pay down debt rather than increasing uh, additional spending. Some commentators said that proves that fiscal transfers are an inefficient policy tool because uh, they're not all being immediately spent. Um, in this model, that's a sign of why they're such an efficient policy tool because there isn't the danger of stimulating inefficient kind of spending, which instead um, almost inevitably occurs if you use um, interest rate cuts. Um, so I think maybe, I, I'm sorry, again, I'm sorry, I, I, I have the wrong slides here. I did want to say um, something further about whether the model implies central banks have nothing to do in, um, uh, in response to a situation like the pandemic. I don't want to say that. What I'm trying to say is that the conventional understanding of what um, monetary policy aims to do, which is to lower safe rates of interest, is not particularly the central thing that needs to be done here. I think there has been an important role of central banks in response to the current crisis in ensuring that problems don't develop in the financial sector because of the absence of the degree of social assurance that would have been needed to achieve the efficient outcome. Uh, that has been important um, also in this model, insofar as the distortions are occurring because of binding borrowing constraints, credit policies that can extend credit that the private sector is not extending can also uh, importantly improve the allocation of resources in this model. Those are things that central banks may well have a, an important role in, but what I want to point out is that it doesn't really have to do with lowering the interest rate on safe assets. Um, it's about um, uh, addressing other uh, aspects of the functioning of, of, of financial markets. And uh, so I would conclude that the fact that central banks are currently, many of them, at their effective lower bound following the, the COVID shock doesn't necessarily mean that these calls for finding ways to relax the zero lower bound by raising the inflation target or abolishing cash are necessarily what we need. Because I think that, um, that the effective lower bound is not really the thing that is, um, uh, that's constraining the recovery so much um, right now. Okay, uh, thank, thank you for that uh, really uh, uh, good presentation. And uh, now, you know, we have some time for, for questions and comments. Just on the point you just made there about credit policies, I mean, uh, you know, just to observe that this is something we spent a lot of time on uh, in redesigning uh, the, the, the targeted lending program, but also, by the way, uh, expanding our, our collateral pool to really pull in, uh, especially um, uh, loans to micro enterprises, uh, loans to sole traders and so on as eligible collateral because this idea that really the, the kind of credit need, the liquidity need would be all over the place, not just the, the larger firms that might be, have access to the bond market and so on. 
uh, let me uh, um, uh, now now turn turn to the audience questions. But maybe, maybe before I turn to the audience, I just add in a, a comment, which of course this is going to be impossible to do. But uh, of course, uh, you also have a, going to have international versions of of the model uh, you, you described, because you know here in the area the. Uh, vertical supply chains, whether within the Euro area or, or globally, are, are so important. Um, and uh, you know, I'm sure that only kind of multiplies up in terms of what the optimal uh, international fiscal response is, the international EU le- or the EU level response, and so on. Okay, so let, let me turn uh, to 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 the questions we have. Uh, so. Um, uh, Bartars uh, is asking, I, I had his question here and that uh, I've lost it, but the, the basic question is uh, after the pandemic is over, let me paraphrase it as after the, the uh, pandemic is over, uh, what what should be the, the kind of fiscal adjustment path after that? Or, or, or do you have any concerns about the fact that after this pandemic, uh, the kind of uh, debt levels will, will have uh, gone up? And of course, uh, maybe one point there is uh, the fact that we've had this pandemic. Does that mean uh, uh, that it's going to be important for the future that fiscal policy recognizes that space will be needed again? That the ability to scale up, you know, in in a large way this time may mean there's a, an option value to having that fiscal space in the future. So I don't know, I mean, maybe I should give you a few questions and then you can uh, see what you want to uh, respond to rather than going by one, one by one, given the, the the limited time we have. So uh, let me uh, see also, uh, uh, what else we have. Um, and again, uh, uh, Okay, so from, uh, from uh, one question I, I had from uh, 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 the floor also is, is also, I mean, now this is outside your, your model, but uh, what, what happens if there are, um, because again, in designing some of the rescue policies, what happens if it's not just a temporary shock, but some sectors are permanently damaged? So less international travel, uh, you know, more working from home. And so some sectors are, uh, you know, for sure now, right now, they have a liquidity problem, but they also have, have a structural problem. Um, so so let me uh, uh, also see now what, what else has come true. Okay, Frederico Ravenna uh, is asking the question, um, how should we, we think, uh, Again, maybe in a similar way, the long term that, you know, do we think maybe that preferences and technologies, which probably are held fixed in many shorter models, may, may permanently change? So maybe that's a, a similar uh, question to, to the previous one. Okay, maybe, uh, maybe I will uh, give you those questions uh, and see, see, see what uh, any comments you have. Okay, I mean, I mean, maybe just starting with the last one, which at least two people had on their mind. Um, uh, you know, I I agree that this is an aspect of the shock that we've just had. That um, uh, that while I I certainly hope that the public health issue is going to be relatively temporary, uh, it's possible that there will be uh, nonetheless permanent changes, say by changing attitudes. If realize some things you know maybe are not as safe as they as they thought before uh, I don't think that particularly changes the message though I mean so that that's not present in the simple model and that means that the the literal conclusions from some of the formulas that I said you know the first best allocation could be achieved by this simple formula of simply transferring to the impacted sectors exactly the revenue they used to get uh, from spending from other sectors, and and similarly, you know, a simple formula for how much to tax other sectors, and things like that depended on um, um, on the very simple setup. But I don't think that the existence of some component of structural change makes this issue go away. I mean, in other words, the issue that the, there's significant disruption of the circular flow of payments, and that this is not a type of shock, 
therefore, where you think that interest rate adjustments themselves um, will largely deal with it. I mean, after all, the, the structural adjustments one's talking about are also very asymmetric. And because they're asymmetric, um, that means that you know, there's also a, a disruption of the circular flow of payments uh, associated with the adjustment process there. Um, the, um, the question from, um, uh, from Bart about, um, am I concerned about big increases in the level of public debt? I mean, the, the answer is yes. I mean, again, it was, it was not addressed in the results on the slide. Um, you know, the, the model on the slide assumes that you can levy lump sum taxes in the future. And so they aren't distorting, even if they turn out to be higher, but in reality, I mean, I think there are. There are important reasons to think that running um, very large debt levels increase various kinds of distortions. And for that reason, I very much agree that there is that what this model implies that there's an important option value to having fiscal space. And I think it's, it's a model that explains why being willing to have um, large increases in transfers uh, for macroeconomic stabilization purposes in response to a certain kind of shocks makes sense, but that's a reason not to be uh, running such large deficits at other times exactly to have the space to do that. I, I, that's certainly the lesson I would encourage people to take from uh, if they take this kind of model seriously. Uh, finally, your, your question at the beginning, what about uh, an international version of the model? I would say yes, I think it has an obvious uh, you know, one could take the model as written down and say those those sectors are regions, right? And well, the thing that's important in the model is they're setting their prices in a common currency. So, well, okay, a monetary union with regions that are subject to regionally specific shocks um, is, is in a situation like that. Uh, one thing that I think is interesting about the model, um, that I think is worth thinking about if you think of it as a model of a monetary union is that it implies that if you had a shock that very significantly impacted productivity in one of these regions rather than the other, that um, it's not just that average utility, that the insurance you might want if you say ex ante, everyone should have thought it could equally well have been our region was going to be impacted and would we like insurance? And the answer, not surprisingly, is yes. Uh, the model says the regions should all like to have some kind of joint um, um, fiscal policy that provides some degree of insurance. But the model is one in which there are aggregate demand externalities also. So we could say, well, I don't know if we're willing to you know, do a policy just because ex ante, not knowing who was going to be which sector we would have chosen it. Even ex post, there can be a reason for others of these regions, the sectors that I'm now calling regions, to benefit um, from this uniform transfer policy. And I showed that there could be benefits um, to the whole system of a policy where there's a uniform transfer to everyone, whether they're the impacted sector or not, and it's paid for in the future by taxes on everyone. And so you could imagine that being something that a, you know, a euro bond uh, would be intended to do, that there would be common borrowing, the proceeds of the borrowing would be distributed in a uniform way, the future repayment obligations would be distributed in a uniform way. This model says that can be very beneficial. Um, some parts, you know, are more needing the additional funds immediately, but that uniform transfer policy tends to, you know, it relaxes borrowing constraints where they need to be relaxed. If they didn't need to be relaxed, it doesn't create uh, inefficiencies particularly and because there are there can be depending on the network structure there can be important um, um, aggregate demand externalities associated with having uh, the borrowing constraints binding in some regions I think that's something to think about in terms of the potential benefits to people in a monetary union of having uh, you know some kind of common fiscal policy of that kind not and it doesn't have to be a policy of saying we'll give transfers to the region uh, that's hit, you know, if you like better the idea of giving out the transfers uniformly, um, then you need bigger, and then you have to borrow more, but the model implies that except for that part, except for the part about raising the overall debt level by more, um, you know, it's not an especially distorting thing to, to make transfers to everyone. So, uh, I mean, I, 
uh, as you speak, I mean, I, I can try and uh, sketch in my head uh, w ways that, that that kind of line of reasoning can be used to interpret what actually happened this summer with the EU Recovery Fund, which is kind of right. a pandemic, spe a pandemic specific. Right. And it's a, it's a situation where I think the, the logic became clearer, whereas in yeah. other situations, it, it may, you know, right. may not have been yeah. as easy a case to make. Sure. Okay. W with that, I think uh, we're hitting our, our time limit, and I'm sure, especially those in the US, well, I, I guess you're going to Labor Day weekend, so maybe you're going to take the afternoon off, but the here in Europe, we're, we're heading into Friday night. Uh, so let me uh, thank you uh, for, for this really fantastic lecture, but let me turn over to Luke to close the event. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, so normally we would continue the discussion over drinks. Um, hopefully we can do that next year. Um, so rest me to just say thank you all for participating. We had uh, about 260 participants um, in the two days. Uh, thanks to the speakers uh, and the excellent uh, discussions. Uh, all the lectures will be up on the ECB YouTube channel and all the presentations will be available on the ECB website uh, shortly. So also thanks to the organizing committee and especially Sabine Wiedemann and Bartosz Maskowiak, who did a lot of the preparatory work. And finally, thanks to Anna Maria Borlescu and Poli Bakomitros, who made sure that there were no technical glitches, which is uh, not something to be taken for granted. There was quite some stress behind the scene. So with that, enjoy your Labor Day weekend or whatever weekend you're going into. Um, bye now from the ECB. Thanks to all of you.